Kings, the 13th chapter, please say amen. Slide your finger all the way down to the 11th verse. And it reads thusly. This is the Apostle Paul. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Amen. Let us bow here for a moment of prayer. Lord, in your awesome power, look down on your son as he begins to speak words, Lord. But Lord, I want you to let these words be the words that will give your ch other children power, that will give them strength, that will help them to rise up, that will give them the power to overcome the evil one. Father, help me, Lord, to have a heart to connect with your people so that we can all work together as one. Father, bless us all, Lord, the hearer, the speaker. Bless the one who's about to go to sleep. Bless the one who's just woke up. Just help us this morning, O oh Lord, to be obedient to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everybody say amen. amen. The title of this sermon is Wake Up, Clean Up, and Grow Up. You know, there was a priest and a pastor were standing by the side of the road, and they were holding up a sign that said, The end is near. Turn around before it's too late. A man in a car drove up and drove past him. As he drove past, he stuck his head out the window. He said, leave us alone, you religious nuts. And he flew right on by. From around the curve, the preacher and the pastor heard tires screeching. Then all of a sudden, they heard a big, fat splash. And one preacher, the preacher said to the other, he said, do you think? Do you, do you just think now? We should have put up a sign that says, the bridge is out. <laughs> Today, <laughs> we'll talk about how the end of this world as we know it is nearer than it has ever been before. The word Advent means coming. As we celebrate the coming of Christ, as we celebrate Christ, as we look to Christ, we must, in fact, understand that the Bible prophesied that Jesus would come in all of the Old Testament. There are eight prophecies about his second coming. Long before Arnold Schwarzenegger said the words, I'll be back, in Revelations 22 and 7, Jesus said, I'm coming soon, which means I'll be back. And we can say with the Apostle John, amen, come, Lord, come on. In today's passage, the Apostle Paul writes in a, a writes with a sense of urgency. We need to be ready for Christ's return at any moment. It could be tomorrow. It could be today. It could be the next moment. Billy Graham once said, we are to wait for the coming of Christ with patience. We are to watch with anticipation. We are to work with zeal. We are to prepare with urgency. And then the famous Bible commentator, Warren Waserbe, sums up today's passage in three words. Wake up, clean up, grow up. That's why I got the title of my sermon. Number one, we got to wake up. Paul begins with an alarm clock analogy. He says in verse 11, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your sleep because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. I am absolutely, friends, convinced that we are living in the last days. You want to know how I know? Because any time between Jesus ascending to heaven and his return from heaven is called end time. No one knows how long this period of time will last, but it's all part of the end times. First century Christians initially believed that Jesus would return immediately. When he didn't, some grew complacent and began to lose a sense of commitment to their faith. So Paul reminded them that they were nearer to their ultimate salvation, their heavenly home. Jesus told a parable with a similar thing, and that's the parable of the ten virgins. Y'all remember that parable? <laughs> in that story, ten virgins, who today we might call bridesmaids, were waiting in the, for the groom to arrive for the wedding, but they got drowsy after waiting all night. 
Finally, word came that the groom was on the way, but the half of the bridesmaids didn't have any extra oil for their lamps. Their oil had run out. They tried to borrow some from the other ones, and the other one said, we don't have enough for both you and I. Y'all better go and get some for yourself. And by the time they did in return, the wedding party had begun, and they were locked out. The central point of the parable reflects the Boy Scouts' motto, be prepared. You never know when the groom will return for his bride. You never know when Jesus is coming back. Scripture repeatedly refers to Jesus as the groom and the church as his bride. Church, wake up from your slumber and get ready for his return because he is coming soon. We can play around all we want to. We can continue to live our life like we want to, rebel rousing and doing everything we want to. But I want you to know the Bible says don't let Jesus come back and catch you with your works undone. Can you say amen? Yeah. Number two, after waking up, we got to clean up. We don't want to be found dirty when Jesus returns. Paul describes the waiting period as night. Growing up, my mother told me when I wanted to stay out late with my friends, nothing good is going to happen in the middle of the night. Paul used night and day not just to illustrate time, but also good and evil. Because in verse 12, he says, the night is nearly over. The day is almost here, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. That last phrase, armor of light, suggests there is some protection in seeking to live a godly life. In verse 13, Paul gives six examples of behavior to avoid. Number one, he says, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing, acting ignorant because of being drunk. That's why the Bible tells us don't take strong drink. That's why when people come to me and ask me the question, um, Rev, uh, uh, is it all right for me if I go to Cheesecake Factory to drink some wine with my dinner? I say, why would you want to do that? You call yourself a Christian. Well, you know, uh, um, they say that white wine goes good with, you know, with this and that. Well, you get the wine in you, and if you get a little in you, like most people, you get a little greedy. Then you got to have two glasses of wine. When you come home, you got to have another glass just, to, just, to, just to, to decompress so you can relax for the rest of the night. And pretty soon, you're saying stuff out of your mouth that you would not otherwise say if you had been sober. Amen? A lot of times, drunks will say things and do things that they would never do if they were sober. My father was a man who was quiet as a mouse all week long. From Sunday to Thursday, he was quiet. But come Friday, he get that first drink of liquor in him, you would think that he was the devil himself. <laughs> it controls your mind, saints. It takes you away from doing what you would otherwise do. The same thing with drugs. Drugs are getting you, and, and I'm not just talking about illegal drugs. I'm talking about even the drugs that are good for you, that you get from the doctor, that you go have to fill a prescription, will take you out of your mind. Yeah, right. Can you say amen? But by God doesn't want us being, he wants us to be alert. And now I want you to know this too. I understand that you have to take the drugs in order to feel better or order to do better. But saints, while you're going through with the drugs, ask God to bless you. That's right. Ask God to take it away from you. Right. Number two, drunkenness. He said that's a habitual excessive use of alcohol. I think I've explained that. Number three, sexual immorality. Not moral, broadly conflicting with general or traditionally held moral principles. There are people out there who I have been to churches in the daytime in my job when I was at Cox. And you go to a church out in the middle of the country, and you find people parked in the back. And you find them having to hurry up and put their clothes on so they can get out of there. It's happening, saints. It's happening. Sexual immorality just doesn't mean you go expose yourself to people passing by your door. Sexual immorality means that you have no control over your sexual self. Right. Well, Pastor, how come you're talking about it? Because it needs to be talked about. For too long, preachers have been hiding and have been afraid to even say the word sex to their congregation because they don't want to feel embarrassed and neither do they want the people to see that they know anything about it. But we all know about it because most of us in here have done it. Can you say amen? So we need to cut it out. We need to teach ourselves to control ourselves, to control this body. The next one is debauchery. We talked about it Wednesday night. 
and debauchery is extreme indulgence in doing things sexual or extreme use of your body. Now, debauchery just doesn't mean sex like a lot of people think. It means doing things like shooting up some heroin. The opioid crisis wouldn't be a crisis if you wouldn't use it. Can you say amen? And so when we do these things, God is saying through the Apostle Paul, don't do these things. Next is dissension. That'll happen on every business business meeting night. There's always that one person, at least one, who wants to bring up contention and cause disunity and cause an arguments to come about. God does, the Bible says through the Apostle Paul, come, let us reason together. You know what reasoning is? Reasoning is I'll listen to what you've got to say, you listen to what i got to say, and then we come up to an agreement. It doesn't mean that I go have it my own way or you have it your way or we ain't going to do it God's way. It means listening to each other and then coming to an agreement. God don't want people who argue. God can't use people who always got something to say that, that's going to destroy the forward movement of the church. Can you say amen? amen? I don't know about y'all, but I get tired of stuff like that. You know, we ought to come together. We ought to know how to come together. We ought to know how to love each other. And it just doesn't happen in church. It happens in your own house. You're looking for an argument. It happens on the job. You're looking for an argument. I got a family member who, who's very skilled, and he'll argue with the owner of the company and say, they ain't supposed to be the way you do it. Who owns the company? Huh? It is that man's company, and you have to obey orders. Amen? I, I thought I had good ideas at cards, but hey, when it's time for me to listen to my boss, I listen to my boss. I ain't going up there to him and say, hey, we ought to be doing this or doing that. Else I'm going to be out on my ear. I wouldn't be able to take care of my bills, take care of my wife, take care of my home. Amen? Jealousy. Yes, it's in the church. I, I better use somebody that's safe. I use Sister Lady E. I use Sister Whitfield. Sister Whitfield comes in and she, you know, uh, she, she cleans up the place. And then somebody else will come behind her and say, she ain't doing a good job. I could do better. Somebody's working with the deacons, and another person say, you know, them deacons ain't no good. I can do better than them. Trustees, financial department, any other. They, could, they even say, you know what, Randolph ain't playing it right. When I was coming up, it was played this way or that way. I can do better than Randolph. We do it all the time, saints. And these are things that God does not want us to do. There is a temptation for everyone. Even after one has sufficiently aged past the physical temptation of, of, of carousing and debauchery, there remain those nasty internal things that you want to talk about somebody and you want to put somebody down and you want to shame somebody and you want to hurt somebody and you want to put them down. You want to make sure that the church doesn't accept them and you want to bring up their past and you want to talk about what they used to do instead of being grateful that they're in church right now. Saints, we've got to not only give up those things that take us away from God overtly, but those things that are hidden in the inside. You're in church. You hear the pastor say, everybody praise the Lord. You won't praise the Lord. Then you go home and you say, how come I got to praise the Lord? What, what, what I got there? What, what did that have to do with me? It has everything to do with it because the Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So when you say, I praise God in another way, the Bible says, let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. You're always talking about how birds praise the Lord. You're always talking about how dogs praise the Lord in the morning. But God don't care about the dog or the cat or the bird. God wants you to praise him because you have a choice whether or not you're going to praise him. Can you say amen? amen? We got that choice. Right. We must do what God say do. So how do we clean up when we so easily return to old, ta old temptations? We can identify what Paul's words in Romans chapter 7 verses 18, 19, and 24. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil is ever present. This keep, 
I keep on doing, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? You see, even when I want to do good, I always turn around and do bad. Paul realized that. Paul realized that he was weak. We have to realize that we are weak. We have to realize that pointing a finger at somebody else without pointing that thumb back to yourself means that you think that you're better than somebody and nobody's better than anybody. I don't care what they did. I don't care how terrible it was. I don't care how nasty it was. I want you to know that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of the Lord. I can't talk about somebody about their life, as long as they're in church trying to do the right thing. That's the most important thing. We got to stop being like these church. I saw a video the other day where the pastor was putting people down because they backslid. That's not our job. Our job is to bring them back in the fold. Our job is to love them. Our job is to put our arms around them. Our job is to make sure they understand that I'm here for you no matter what you're going through. That's why the millennials are leaving the church. That's why they're leaving. Millennials are leaving because we're hypocrites. Pastor, why you say that? Why you say they, they look at us like we're hypocrites? Because we say one thing in church and do another thing at home. Huh? Amen? I'm not going to fool myself into thinking this stuff ain't happening. It's happening. If the Apostle Paul said it was happening in his time, what makes me think everything's going to change now? We got more dogs in the church than we've ever had before. We almost need to call it the Diamond Grove Kennel or the First Baptist Kennel or anything because all we got in church is dogs. They come in dressed up and looking good, looking pretty, looking handsome, and all they want to do is to make sure they'll be able to tell somebody on Monday that I went to church yesterday. They're not living a the thing. They're not doing a the thing. They're not striving to please God. They're not showing love. They're not having joy. We should make each other laugh at least once a day. Can I use you as an example? I called the house one day, and he was talking, and I said something. I said, Pastor, I'm so glad I called. I know I was calling for business, but I'm so glad I called because this is the best laugh I had all day. That's my thing. I learned that when I was growing up. Now I was very shy. I know you can't tell it now because I talk a lot. Talk too much sometimes. But when I was growing up, I was very, very shy. And I know it came from my father, you know, who said to me to my face, you ain't my son. You know, you're no good. You're, you're, you're sickly. You know, you ain't my, my family. The sick people don't come from my family. They come from somewhere. But I was very shy. But then when I got to high school, 10th grade, I remember like it was yesterday. I said, you know what? Because I was scared to death of girls. Scared to death. I was scared to death, bro. Scared to death. I wouldn't say nothing to a girl. A girl said something to me, I was like. <laughs> 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 Hi, Donnell. <laughs> Donnell, can you help me do with my work? <laughs> Shot. And so one day I made up my mind. I said, you know what? I'm going to make some female laugh today. And I can't remember what the joke was. It was corny, you know. But I said the joke, they broke out and saw a laugh. And they said, Donnie, that's the corniest joke I ever heard in my life. But it let me know they were human too. And then when I began to make her laugh, I began to make another one laugh. And then I began to talk to another one. Pretty soon I was talking. I was able to come out of my bag. I was able to say things to people. By the time I got to church, Pastor Stokes would put me on a pulpit and say, you're going to give us a mini sermon. You're going to tell us something about the Bible. And I began to speak, and I began to speak. And then I got to the point where I can't shut up. <laughs> and how do I know I'm talking too much? Because my wife tells me all the time, Donna, can't you just be quiet now? I'm trying to go to sleep. Will you shut up? <laughs> because I talk too much. My mom said, look, look, I'm not here to talk all day. I'm just here to see how you're doing. Are you doing all right? Yeah. Goodbye. Because I talk. I talk. But you've got to come out of who you are. And we can't put the next person down because they're not like us. 
There are a lot of people who are shy. There are a lot of people who feel like they're on the bottom of the rung of the ladder. And we need to let them know that you can turn the ladder upside down and the bottom rung becomes the top rung. Can you say amen? We've got to let them know. we got to build their esteem. we got to make them feel like they're one of us. we got to take that shy person and say, you are, that's all right. You be shy now, but you'll grow out of it. we got to get do something to inspire them. we got to build their faith. we got to make sure that they understand that God only not, not only does he love me, but he loves you too. Can you say amen? Can you say amen? So there's no room for putting each other down. There's no room at all. Our only hope for change rests in Jesus. Did you hear me? The last thing we're looking at is to grow up. Sometimes I love technology and sometimes I hate it. <laughs> Number three, grow up. Paul says, if you really want to clean up, you need to get rid of the old clothes that don't fit anymore. <laughs> Put on new clothes. Appropriate to your standing as a follower of Christ. You see, some of us are still trying to wear this stuff that we, or live the life that we lived when we was in the world. You know? If I was a jitterbug and a night crawler, <laughs> I'm going to come to church and be a jitterbug and a night crawler. Huh? That's what we do. Some of us, uh, we used to be greedy in the world, and now we come to church and we greedy, be greedy in the church. You know, you, you, you just can't eat one chicken, one piece of chicken and have some greens. You got to have six pieces. <laughs> then you want to take some home. God didn't call us to be greedy, did he? <laughs> God called us to take what is sufficient. Amen. And we got to take what is sufficient. You know, sometimes, saints, we get ourselves in the biggest stuff. You know, I was, we was talking to somebody, I forgot, last week, and they were telling us about how their diabetes is going crazy. This is somebody out in the streets. And um, we said, well, what are you doing about it? Well, I'm taking all the medicine, but it don't seem to work. Well, well, what are you doing wrong? Well, I'm, I'm doing everything right. I'm eating like they told me. They told me to eat six times a day, but you're not supposed to eat six full meals a day. Six full meals a day, that's going to kill your diabetes. You're killing yourself. Small, small portions. Instead of putting it on a platter, put it on a saucer. You see what I'm saying? We kill ourselves because we still have that mindset that we can do like we used to do. And, and look, I used to eat three cheeseburgers, a big bowl of fries, and have a two 16-ounce sodas at one sitting. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I did. Blood pressure sky high. Didn't care. End up getting this blotch on my eye. If you look at me real close, you can see a, a blotch that when my blood pressure got so high, my eye turned red and it never, that blot never left. That was me. But when I began to learn to control myself. Friends, we're going to stop right here and return next week with the next part in this study. So don't forget. Next week, the same time. Pastor Darnell E. Whitfield is thankful that you decided to listen to today's study and invite you to come back again every Saturday and learn the truth of the Holy Bible that will bring wisdom to your life and peace to your soul. You can visit our website at lifechurchohr.org. Lifechurchohr is all one word, L-I-F-E-C-H-U-R. C H O H R dot O R G. You can join our Lessons for Life blog, which comes out every Wednesday, by seeing us your email address to lifechurchhr at outlook dot com. Lifechurchhr at outlook dot com. Friends, please help our ministry to continue the work of pointing people to Christ and serving our community with a donation of $10 or more through the church's PayPal account, or you can send your checks to our business suite at Life Church of Hampton Roads, 4240 Portsmouth Boulevard, Suite 433, Chesapeake, Virginia, 23321.